All right, Kristen Glenn. So awkward. Oh, sorry. So, Kristen. Yes. Is it Kristen or Kirsten? Kristen. I know. Uh, <laughs> it, it's just one of those names that I, do people get it wrong frequently? All the time. Good. I'm glad it's not just me. Uh, often it's just me getting things wrong. So, um, tell me about uh, your company. You started it via Kickstarter, is that correct? Yeah, so, so I guess I'm going to have to tell you like, the, the whole story to really... You can just tell me the really short version. I'll give you the really short version. Yeah. Um, so in 2008, I went traveling for a little over a year, and I came back to the States not knowing what I was going to do, and like all young people these days, decided to start a business with my friend Shannon. So we were kind of tossing around ideas and figuring out what to do, and we kept coming back to this idea of travel fashion and like super versatile clothes. Um, neither of us had any degree in fashion, had never worked in a boutique before, nothing. So we started like Googling, as you do, how clothes are made. Huh. And this is sort of how I entered the sustainable fashion industry. Huh. Um, and so you weren't environmentalist in the beginning. You became concerned you know, with I, that? I was an environmentalist, but I was also a shopaholic. So that doesn't even make sense. But I, uh -huh. you know, if you asked me where I got something, I would tell you the store. And I wouldn't think about all the people and hands and raw materials that went into that item that I was wearing. So you didn't think about that. No, not at oh. all. I was just like, how cheap is it? I want it. So you were not closet. an environmentalist in the beginning. <laughs> okay, so I think I was because I would like pick up my trash and like save water and recycle. Oh, and that okay. Kind of but thing. then in shopping, but then I would just go shopping. Right. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's sort of like a vegan six day a week vegan. And <laughs> right. Seventh day you're like. It's it's Kill like I, I would I would buy some some organic vegetables, but I never made that connection like all the way through to like my cotton t-shirt or my toothpaste. Or I was looking else. at your website just to interrupt the flow of your story. Sure. Uh, and it said, which was incredibly um, inspiring in a negative sense. It was mm -hmm. kind of eye-opening. It said, "What percentage of uh, clothes are made here in the U.S. that we um, wear?" In 2011, it was two percent. Right. that are made in the U.S. And in 1968, that number was 98%. And in 1990, it went down to 50%, and now it's only 2%. So it's so very So basically the Mad Men era, they started wearing polyester, and that was the death of Made in America. Sort of. I think NAFTA may have been a, a little more the death, the death of it. But in the 90s, companies started moving overseas, uh -huh. and uh, because you could get cheap labor, and there were you know, not as many regulations. Um, so if so I were a Republican, uh, I would say, what's wrong with cheaper labor? Like business is going to, like water, it's going to flow to wherever right. it can no find Right, no big deal. The, the right. problem is that overseas it's so hard to regulate as I'm sure you guys have had, um, I've read posts on the Elephant Journal about what's happened in Bangladesh. Yeah. And the thing is, it's so hard to trace. Like even if you go and visit your factory in China, you don't know who they're subcontracting to, who they're subcontracting to. So it's really tough to kind of figure out where your clothes are really made unless you can like see it in person. To right. you, there's this thing called dead stock, which I find really right. exciting. What's, what's that? So dead stock is discards, leftovers, and um, slightly flawed fabrics that otherwise wouldn't be used in production. And so what we do at Seemly is take those fabrics and turn them into new clothes here in the US. So you get all kinds of random fabrics and designs and yes. colors? And some of them are, are really easy to work with and they come to me and they're beautiful and then others have like a huge hole in the middle here or like a break in the fabric here and all kinds of crazy things so it's really tough to work around that stuff and still like make a pretty garment but and that's why no one else or most others that's don't why do most it. big companies won't do it because it's it's very inefficient so when we're buying new clothes from you from seemly right. it's essentially uh, recycled or reused clothing, secondhand. Essentially, so a, a great example um, would be this fabric that's for the Versalette, which is one thing you can wear 30 different ways. And, and that's what you kickstarted, right? Yes, okay. and yeah, I definitely want to tell you about that. Um, so it's knitted in New York and it's custom made. So if there's anything wrong with it, um, if it's a little bit the wrong color, if it's a little bit the wrong weight, they can't sell it to their end customer. So I connect with people like that and say, when you have something that goes wrong, like tell me and I'll take it from you. and. I pay them for it and then make new stuff. Hmm. Yeah. So the Versalette is, why is it called the Versalette? Uh, because it's super versatile. It's yeah. one thing that can be worn 30 different ways. It can be a purse or a formal dress or a, 
hiking? Um, yeah, something? I mean, I wouldn't wear it to prom or a wedding, but it's definitely okay. something you can wear for like pretty much any season, tons of different occasions. And we came up with this because we were both travelers. Mm -hmm. And when I was overseas, I saw how, how much stuff I had, even in my backpack. And then I came home and I saw how much stuff I had. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what am I doing? And as we were you know, talking about fashion and, and designing travel clothes, that really hit home and, and um, caused us to want to create like versatile things that you can, you can have one piece and still have tons of options, cut down on the resources used to make it, and also just like make your life easier. But that's not really the American way, right? The American, we right. want more stuff. <laughs> right. So why do you want less? Because you were traveling, you had to carry it? Was yeah, that the, yeah. Uh -huh. Because yeah. having, I think having things like really can weigh on you, mm. but that's not the American way. Well, right. The American way originally maybe was about the pursuit of happiness. So what is that happiness? Right. Right. To be and fair to the American way, it's also kind yeah. of awesome. It's, it is kind of awesome. However, I think I've thought so much about how we consume and and what that means. And for me, I, you know, as like a former shopaholic, I would walk into a store and, you know, it looks great and that's kind of what I want my life to look like. It's organized. And then I go try something on and it makes me look really good. And then I think about like where I'm gonna go in it and like who's gonna like me and right. how accepted I'm gonna be. And I think it really plays to your feelings of um, connection that everyone like wants so much. And for a fleeting moment, you get that feeling of connection when you buy something new. And it's like right. addicting and you just go back and go back and go back. Mm -hmm. You know, we all shop because we want to kind of like be surrounded by like beautiful things and we want to look at them. I know for me, I, that's like why I would go shop. And if I can create an experience where someone can want to go there for a positive reason, to look at something pretty that's cool, but then they can also um, get like a little kind of moment of truth about the negative impacts of of the fashion industry in general, that's like yeah. totally what I'm into. So I was really interested that you said that because huh. that's like my whole jam. Well, I was really interested in your website, which your boyfriend was saying you designed, developed, and coded the whole thing. It's talk about you know uh, craftsmanship or yeah. craftswomanship. I like to make things. Yeah, it's a it's a gorgeous website. I was looking at it and I was like, who is this? I wanna I wanna steal them or at least <laughs> steal the design. You know, pay them less. Like outsource it to <laughs> India. <laughs> Well, I don't pay myself anything, so right. less is more Hypocrite. than that. <laughs> yeah. um, but, and then I was watching one of your videos, and it's like uh, almost the opposite experience. It's beautiful, but it's heartbreaking. It's right. you know, showing the dyes going into our rivers and um, right. you know, dye, no pun intended. And uh, you know, it's, it's really heartbreaking. I really recommend people, maybe mm -hmm. we'll try and link that to the yeah, video. Yeah, that'd be great. And that's actually one of the first images I saw when researching how do you make clothes and then realizing that the way our clothes are made is like super messed up. Yeah. The, first, the first thing I came across was this Greenpeace report and it, it included aerial images of a town in China that basically makes like 80% of the world's jeans. So everyone who lives in this town makes jeans or they snip the like threads off of jeans or whatever. And you can see on, on Google Maps, even right now you could go and look at it, out of the factories and into the Pearl River goes this, oh, right. whoom, this blue dye, and then it goes into the Delta. One of your and you new can fans. see it like I know. <laughs> loves me. <laughs> you can see the dye from jeans just like yeah. billowing out into waterways. And yeah. it's horrifying. Yeah. And that was kind of the first moment where I was just like And just oh so my people gosh. know, I mean they probably know, but dyes aren't made out of like blue flowers. Right. They're it's, made it's out of like, heavy metals, <laughs> like chromium, cadmium, like all carcinogenic, right. super bad stuff. Um, one thing I find among many super inspiring about what you and many other people have done, you kids these days, is you've yeah. kickstarted it. Yeah. Which I don't think, I mean, I, th I know you appreciate because we talked about it uh, beforehand, but I think, you know, when I started Elephant uh, 25 years ago, when I was four, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm making up a lot of math right there, <laughs> 11 years ago uh, when I was 28. Um, you know, it was with my life savings, which was far less than what you raised. Mm -hmm. And I did that because I didn't want any investors. Yeah. And Kickstarter, to me, enables people to not ask the man for permission to start a business, which yes. I love. Yeah. It enables you not to have investors. And investors are deadly to businesses that care about 
uh, what Elephant cares about, what many of us care about, which is being a benefit. Because if you get investors, as Steve Demos, one, someone I've interviewed, anyone know Steve Demos? Anyone? The founder of Silk Soy and White Wave, at the time of his sale, the largest organic company in the entire world. He wow. said, there's no such thing as an angel investor. Mm. Show me an angel investor who will walk away from their money and I'll show you a true angel investor. So the second you get any investment, even from friends and family generally, you have to sell. And a business that is devoted to selling has to be devo uh, devoted to profits mm -hmm. from Huffington Post to whatever. So it doesn't mean those companies are bad, but right. it means that their mission isn't first to do the right thing, usually. Right. Um, that's why all our favorite companies, Patagonia or whatever, are almost all independent or family-owned, New York Times, so, or family-controlled at least. Right. So Kickstarter, you raised an incredible amount of money. How much did you raise? Yeah, so this was two years ago, and with a company, Revolution Apparel, which we've since moved on from, um, we were going to raise 20000 and then we raised over 60000 to finish. So your goal and was 20000 Our goal was $20,000. And we were like, I was about to throw up all over my computer when we pressed the launch <laughs> button. I was just like, there's no way this is going to happen. And it, it turned out that people really care, which was so cool. Right. I had no idea that people cared. Right. <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> Kristen Glenn Seemly. <laughs>